I guess we can start. Um, welcome everybody for this first uh, Lugano undergraduate philosophy conference. Uh, we were reasoning together with Claudio Calosi in the audience before um, on whether this is the first undergraduate philosophy conference uh, on the European continent and we were not able to think of any other preceding event of this kind. So it may indeed be the first uh, uh, philosophy undergraduate conference uh, on the European continent. And uh, the original idea of holding uh, a philosophy undergraduate conference uh, in Lugano was uh, suggested by Achille Varzi when he was lecturing here during last semester. And uh, we decided to accept the suggestion and uh, um, I myself, myself uh, uh, was a little bit afraid because uh, um, European students are known to be a little bit uh, shy. And so I was not sure we would have been able to receive enough su uh, submissions in the end. And we were very pleased to receive in the end 35 uh, submissions. So we have been able to select a little bit uh, uh, among the, uh, the, the submissions. And in the end, we accepted 11 uh, students that are here to present their work. And uh, we hope that uh, this is going to be just the first one, but there will be others to come um, in the following years. So the Lugano Undergraduate Philosophy Conference is organized by philosophers in Lugano that are involved in the organization um, of the Master in Philosophy in uh, Lugano, which is a new master uh, which opened under the, the direction of Kevin Mulligan last year. So it is a new master <coughs> in philosophy. And I think that unlike uh, other masters, uh, in philosophy, it has some uh, uh, remarkable features. Uh, the first one is that it tries to um, bridge the gap or unify uh, the approach of uh, analytic philosophy and the history of philosophy. Um, the second one is that it has a, a thematic unity. There is a topic that unifies the, all the teaching that is uh, given within the master, and the topic of next year is going to be time and existence. And the third remarkable feature is that we are committed to invite to teach in Lugano um, several uh, philosophers from all over the world, which we take to be very interesting. And uh, we'd like to mention just some names um, that will be in Lugano to teach in our master next year. Um, Peter Simons from Trinity College Dublin, Kit Fine from New York University, Francesco Berto, who is here with us, Catherine Koslicki, Anna Marmodono from the University of Oxford, Francois Recanati from uh, the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, and many others. And uh, I already mentioned uh, Francesco Berto, who has already taught this year and he's going to teach um, in Lugano next year as well. And um, I'm happy now to uh, let Francesco give the keynote uh, talk uh, in this Lugano uh, undergraduate philosophy conference. So. so thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, it's good to be here again. And when I was invited to give a talk, um, I thought that since the this is a master which is very much focused on metaphysics. And since I've been teaching ontology and meta-ontology, and since the topic of next year is time and existence, I'd better give a talk on metaphysics, or rather ontology, or rather meta-ontology, or rather meta-ontology focused on existence. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, so the subtitle of my talk uh, Meinongians versus Quinians on the meaning of existence will already make you suspect that this is going to be a meta-ontological talk 
if you know something about what meta-ontology is, and if you attended the course that I gave here, uh, you know what meta-ontology is. So the guy who introduced the term, or rather, as I recently learned, the guy to, who reintroduced the term meta-ontology, it wasn't invented by him, it was invented by Martin Heidegger, but the guy who reintroduced the term, Peter Vanniewagen, gave two characterizations of meta-ontology. He said that meta-ontology is about the methodology of ontology, and we will indeed make some met methodological points today. And uh, also meta-ontology is, in a sense, about the meaning of being. Or if you think that being and existence are the same, we will get back to this, it's about the meaning of existence. Doesn't that sound great? Because okay. Van Wagen said, well, Quine told us that the fundamental question of ontology has to do with what there is. But then we need the name for the question, what do we mean when we investigate on what there is? Okay, what is the meaning of the question, what is there? And he said, well, let's call that the meta-ontological question. Hmm? Um, so this, this is gonna be a meta-ontological talk in this sense. And also the title is in the ballpark of meta-ontology, because you may know that the mainstream topic in meta-ontology has to do with some people, neo-Carnapians and others, who think that many debates in ontology are just shallow. They're based on misunderstandings, meaning changes. They're debates that you fix by looking at how, at what people mean with the words that they use, rather than at how things are out there in the world. Okay. That's gonna be another recurring topic in this talk. Okay. Uh, what I haven't talked about is Meinongians versus Quinians, but we'll come, we will come to this soon. So I'm gonna start with a quotation. The quotation comes from the very first words, the beginning of a book, which is an introduction to ontology. And it starts with meta-ontological considerations. The, this, this is a little book which has been written by a very good ontologist and metaphysician, good friend of mine, and also a person that has been mentioned uh, a few minutes ago because he's been teaching in this master program. Okay. Uh, let's, see what this, ha, let's see how this person starts uh, this introduction to ontology. It's an introduction for undergraduates, basically. Okay. So that's how it begins. It says, it is customary to identify ontology with that branch of philosophy that originates from the question, what is there? And it is customary to claim that this question has two kinds of answer. The first answer is easy, if not trivial, and can be summed up in one word, everything. As Quine has written, everything exists because it makes no sense to speak of non-existent entities. And those who think otherwise would manifest not an ontological disagreement, but a misunderstanding of the very concept of existence. Precisely because it would be inconsistent to claim that something does not exist, though, to claim that everything exists is tautological, that is devoid of content, therefore of interest. Okay? So that's the first thing you learn if you, study, if you start studying ontology from this book. Now, maybe some of you have guessed who's the author of this book. Any clue? Achille. Yeah, that's Achille Varzi. Ontologia. That was my English translation from that Italian book. Okay, now. This talk will take a clue from that initial passage of Achille's book and will focus around these two sentences. We'll go through these two sentences again and again. The M sentence, there are things that do not exist. The Q sentence, everything exists. And you may have already guessed uh, why I used the, the letters M and Q. Okay. So the M sentence is the Meinongian sentence. So that's Alexis Meinung, um, Austrian philosopher, psychologist, phenomenologist from the Brentano School, also ontologist, who is most famous for a little book called Gegenstand's theory, the theory of object. Whose most famous claim is that one? The claim that there are things that do not exist. Whereas Q, of course, stands for Quine, 
okay, who begins his most famous paper on what there is by saying, well, you can phrase the fundamental ontological question in three words. Uh, what is there? You can answer in one word, everything. That's the easy answer, Achille told us. The easy, obvious, tautological, uninteresting answer, okay? Good. Now, notice three things about these two sentences. First, on the face of it, they contradict each other. It may be false that they contradict each other. They may look like they contradict each other, but we may conclude after some discussion or analysis or whatever that that's not the case. But on the face of it, they're contradictories. Um, second, um, they don't belong in semantics on the face of it. Okay. So they're not sentences that quote words rather than using them. They're not sentences that speak about meanings, denotations, senses, truth, truth conditions, aboutness, whatever. Okay. Third, there are sentences that use uh, everyday words, words that you're going to use 10 times a day. Okay. Everything, not, exists, things. Okay. They're not especially technical or philosophical words. The words we all use all the time. Okay? So focus on these three features of this couple of sentences to begin with. Okay, now the majority party here is, of course, uh, the Quinian party. And Quinians very often claim that the M sentence is not just wrong, it's wrong in some obvious, specially blatant, manifest way. I'll give you some quote. This is Bill Lycan, back to the 70s. I really cannot understand relentlessly Meinongian quantification at all. To me, it is literally, literally gibberish and mere noise. Yes, Peter Manningwagen, we will talk a lot about Manningwagen today. In sum, there are no things that do not exist. This thesis seems to me so obvious that I have difficulty in seeing how to argue for it. Okay. Jason Stanley, surely there are no non-existent objects. Surely that is a truism if anything is. So the M sentence is not just wrong. Okay. It's either meaningless or if it's false, uh, it's false in such an obvious way that it's even difficult to think how to argue against somebody who comes up claiming that thing. Okay. Okay, good. Um, now, what I'm going to focus on in the talk is two objections to the M sentence. Um, two objections that can be extracted and developed starting with that initial passage from the Introduction to Ontology by Achille Vard. Okay. So the first sentence he, he has that I'm going to use is this one. It makes no sense to speak of non-existent entities and those that think otherwise would manifest not an ontological disagreement, but a misunderstanding of the very concept of existence. You can develop the following objection out of this claim. I'm going to call this the objection from equivocation. It's based on the view that there's some misunderstanding or equivocation going on in the Meinongian claim. You may develop it thus. Q and M appear to express contradictory propositions, but they do not. The Meinongian asserted M is not really disagreeing with the Quinian. She displays some basic misunderstanding. To use a Quinian catchphrase, she is changing the subject. Now, you may know that Quine famously used the, this phrase, a catchphrase. It's one of the rhetorical catchphrases, famous rhetorical catchphrases used by Quine in philosophical <laughs> logic. He was arguing about debates. Uh, he was arguing on debates on alternative non-classical logics. Okay. So when the classical logician, non-classical logician thinks he's criticizing the classical logician, actually he, he gives a different meaning to some logical word. He's changing the subject. We will come back with this because there are interesting parallels between the debate on existence and the debate on logical notions uh, 
in the confrontation between classical logicians and non-classical logicians. The second objection I'm going to focus on, and we will develop the first one a little bit later on. Uh, here's the second one. Uh, initial quote from uh, Achille, it's easy if not trivial to see that the M sentence is false, just as to claim that everything exists is totally logical, so it is inconsistent to claim that something doesn't exist. Call this second one the objection from analyticity. Why analyticity? Because you may develop it in the following way. Q and M really express contradictory propositions in the debate, and Q expresses an easily recognizable near tautological analytic truth, precisely a Frege analytic one. We'll get back to the notion of Frege analyticity, but basically a sentence is Frege analytic, which you, when you obtain it, from a logical truth by replacement of synonyms. Okay. So M expresses an easily recognizable near inconsistent Frege analytic falsity. We will develop this one too. So as a preliminary remark, notice that you cannot rise one and two together because two assumes something that one denies, namely that M and Q really express contradictory propositions in the debate. Okay. They, don't, they don't just look contradictory, they really are. But I will begin with the other one, the claim that, they, that assumes that they only look like they're contradicting each other, but they don't. Okay, so here's the, cons the, the objection from equivocation. I will start by telling you something about so-called epistemological conceptions of analyticity. That's an idea that you find in Bogosian, and which has been criticized by Tim Williamson. Let me say immediately that I am on Tim Williamson's side on this. We will get back to this. Uh, basically, epistemological conceptions of analyticity say that uh, some sentences are such that failure to recognize them as true is sufficient for misunderstanding. And objection one has it that Q is one such sentence. Oh, if you contrapose, this view says, look, there are some sentences which are so fundamental to the meanings of some words that if you don't assent to those sentences, if you reject them, or if you are not disposed to take them as true, the exact attitude here is not very important, that entails that you misunderstood some meaning. You lack some concept, you got some meaning of some word wrong. Okay, so examples that are given around back to logic are, look, if you claim that there are counterexamples to modus ponens, you don't quite understand what if then means. If you claim that there are two contradictions, you don't quite get how negation works or what truth is. Okay, that's more or less the view. Objection one is that uh, the M sentence is that kind of sentence. So, uh, the Meinongian asserting M aims at contradicting Q but it just shows lack of some linguistic or conceptual competence which is needed to fully grasp what she tries to deny. Then what M means in her mouth is not really the contradictory of what Q means. A parenthetical remark, you may wonder whether M means anything at all. Or, as Lycan said, it's just gibberish or mere, mere noise. But change from meaningfulness to meaninglessness is meaning change already and enough to fail to contradict. Okay. Looks like I'm contradicting you, but even if what I say has no meaning, I'm not contradicting you. Now, on which word or words is the Meinongian equivocating here? Remember what I told you before, Q and M on the face of it are not explicitly about language. Okay. No word uh, is mentioned words are used, there are no semantic notions involved here on the face of it. Well, the first aspect is the quantifiers. Okay, so the Meinongian saying there are things that do not exist. Side remark, notice that some linguists don't take there are to be a proper quantifier. They take expressions like some, all, many to be properly called quantifiers. Okay, there's disagreement about that, but I will stick to the logician terminology, and logicians uniformly take there is as a quantifier, just like some, all, and so on. Okay. 
and quantifiers are the usual suspects in many meta-ontological debates. Okay. Take a famous debate between two philosophers, DKL, saying there exist tables and coins, they fill tower fusions. PVI saying no, 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 there exist neither coins, they fill tower fusions, nor tables, only simple storage table-wise. You have already guessed uh, who DKL is and who PVI is. Who's DKL? Yeah, that's David Coward Lewis and PVI. That's Peter Van Wagen. Okay. Now, some people say, for instance, some deflationists um, like Eli Hirsch, they say, well, that debate is shallow. Looks like they're contradicting each other. They may think they're contradicting each other. They're not. Okay. Um, Given the DKL sense of there is or there exists, DKL is right, and given the PVI sense of there is or there exists, PVI is right. Okay. But that's a shallow debate. They're just talking past each other. So maybe Quinians and Minongians do mean different things by their respective there are and every in the QNM sentences. I think that's wrong. And they agree with a committed Quinian on this. That's Vanningwagen, who famously said, the new Minongians and I mean the same thing by the unrestricted quantifier. Bracket the, the gloss unrestricted here. We may get back to this later on. Okay. I think Vanningwagen is right. Why? Well, to argue for that, I'm just going to develop uh, a line of thought. Uh, by this person, uh, Tim Williamson, uh, who, as I said before, has argued against the uh, uh, epistemological conceptions of analyticity. According to Williamson, it is never the case that when somebody who is a competent speaker of, let's say, English, denies a, a, a fundamental logical principle like modus ponens, the person is misunderstanding the meaning of if then. Okay. The person may have wildly weird, strange beliefs about the meaning of if then. But it's not that if then means something different in the mouth of the person. So, uh, says Williamson, no given argument or statement is immune from rejection by a linguistically competent speaker. Quine's epistemological holism in two dogmas undermines his notorious later claim about the deviant logician's predicament. When he tries to deny the doctrine, he only changes the subject. He goes back to that Quinean motto that I mentioned before. Okay. So Williamson is saying, this Quine, the Quine of philosophical logic is wrong. It's not the case that when uh, the intuitionistic logician comes in and says, oh, excluded middle phase, so uh, P or not P, the intuitionistic logician means something else by not. Or, or. The good coin is the, the coin of two dogmas, the holist coin. Why? Well, these are more or less Williamson's considerations. So, according to a widespread view, competence in a given language is holistically entailed by full participation in the communication practices of the relevant linguistic community. Okay. That's what that's the basis of linguistic competence. There's a beautiful book by the great Italian philosopher of language, Diego Marconi, Lexical Competence. He focuses on lexical semantics, uh, which makes this point in a very good way. Next, every there is and some and any and most and all, these are all words that a competent English speaker effortlessly uses in everyday talk. And Williamson in his campaign against epistemic analyticity says that it's vital for any mainstream account of reference that the intention to use an expression with a referent it has in the community be normally successful. Now, my nongas are clear that they want their words to be interpreted as words of ordinary English, and this should be taken into account when assessing semantic competence. 
By this picture, native English speaking Mainongians were linguistically competent way before learning anything about ontology. It's not that they were natural born ontologists. Okay. They were just born, they learned English, they went to study philosophy at some point, maybe they heard the story of this Austrian guy, they heard uh, Frege, Russell, Quine speaking about existence. They were unconvinced. They said, mm, maybe that mainstream story about existence doesn't work. Maybe the Austrian guy was right. Okay. Um, they may have been led or maybe misled, because they might be wrong in their view, into believing in the M sentence by generalizing from a large number of common sense quantified claims they heard since they were children, uttered by people from their linguistic community. And these are the kind of claims that anyone can make. The something which has been sought by many, namely the site of, of Atlantis, but it doesn't exist. Some of the gods are tempestos, but of, go but of course no gods exist. Oh, that's the kind of claim that your greedy uncle may make. Uh, I thought of something I would like to give you as a Christmas gift, but I couldn't buy it for you because it doesn't exist. Okay. Okay, then they generalize the Mainongian and they say, well, some things do not exist. It's implausible that the quantifier changed its meaning in the Mainongian's mouth, or that they started unbeknownst to them to equivocate when they moved from accepting sentences such as those to accepting the M sentence. If native English speaking, speaking Mainongians were linguistically competent at the time of their understanding and use of quantified sentences like the above, they still are. That holds in general. Williamson says, and now he's, he's considering the case of some crazy guy who denies the sentence, all vixens are vixens. Okay. And the supporter of the epistemological conception of analyticity says, well, this person doesn't know what all means. Or maybe this person doesn't understand how conditionals work. Um, Williamson says, no. We cannot understand these people better if we translate their word, the word of quantification in the case, by some non-homophonic expression or treat it as untranslatable. But if that holds for the quantifiers that show up in our sentences, well, the same holds also for the other bits of language in Q and in M. Again, these include only everyday words like thing, not, exist, so Williamson's point applies to them too. Those words don't change their meaning when we move uh, from the Quinean uttering them in that sentence for, to the Minongian uttering them in that other sentence. Okay, so from, from now on I will focus on that other little word, exist, because I think that's gonna help us to get a better picture of the debate between Quinians and Minongians. I'm going to use another quote from Van Wagen, and I'm going to agree with Van Wagen again. He says, You will misunderstand what I have been saying if you take me to have been saying that the neo minongians on the one hand and I on the other, mean two different things by exist. The neo minongians and I have different theories about what exist means. When they use the English word exist, they mean by it what it means. And if that happens to be, as I say it is, not all not, they mean not all not by exist. Although, according to their mistaken theory about the meaning of exist, that is not what they mean by it. I think that's exactly right. Still, he's speaking about people having different theories. So you may say, Maybe there is an equivocation going on, but it's an equivocation at the theoretical level. It's not that they, without being aware of that, attach different meanings to the words they use. Okay. But there are two opposed theories, or families of theories, characterized to different concepts. So it may be claimed that which properties picked out by the two theories are families thereof. Actually, 
maybe better to speak of families of theories because they are very different Meinongian theories. So Ed Zalta's Meinongian theory is very different from Terence Parsons' Meinongian theory. There are also different Quinean theories of existence. So Frege's theory is very different from Quine's theory. Anyway, let's just, just speak about theories. One may claim that which property is picked out by the T theory is partly determined by the principles characterizing it. You may take these as given implicit definitions. Now let's not get into complications that have to do with implicit definitions. Uh, but let's draw a parallel again with debates uh, in the philosophy of logic, in particular debates on negation. You may know that non-classical logics differ from each other and disagree with classical logic on lots of things. One of the most important disagreements has to do with the behavior of negation. There is nearly no law of negation from classical logic which has not been contested by somebody. Okay. Excluded middle, uh, double negation introduction, double negation elimination, contraposition, uh, De Morgan's laws, okay. x files. So. so in the light of this, some people have made claims like the following. So this is Graham Priest. He doesn't endorse the view, okay. but he, he gives a, a nice overview. Um, and that's, that's a kind of, kind of claim that you actually hear people making uh, in debates on non-classical logic. Um, well, there's no such thing as negation. There are lots of different negations, Boolean negation, intuitionist negation, the Morgan negation. Each of these behaves according to a set of rules. Each is perfectly legitimate, and we are free to use whichever notion we wish, as long as we are clear about what we are doing. Did the Meinongian and Quinean talk about different properties or features, at least in this sense? Maybe when they speak with the vulgar, they mean the same by exist. But when they engage in theoretical reflection on existence, they just end up characterizing different things. Like some people may claim, oh, intuitionists give a certain characterization of a thing, intuitionistic negation, and classical logicians give a different characterization of another thing, classical negation. Okay. So maybe there's a Meinongian characterization of a thing, and there's a Quinean characterization of a different thing. I think this is also false. It's false if you look at how the debate uh, between the two parties actually unfolds and develops. It doesn't seem to me that the two theoretical views of existence characterize their own object as it were de dicto. I'm using de dicto in a loose sense here, as whatever satisfies the principles of the theory. Okay. Minonians and Quinians have a flatly dere attitude in the sense that the disagreement doesn't boil down to each part is arrogating the word existence to name its own property. Each aims at theorizing on that feature which is existence Provided a providing a certain characterization of it. So for a minonian like Graham Priest, for instance, that's a real property, a non-trivial feature that some things have, others lack. Okay. This is an echo of Kant, of course. You know, he never said that existence is not a predicate. He said that existence is not a real predicate. Okay. And uh, the Quinans can have their existence property. It's a mistake to say that according to the Kant, uh, Frege, Russell, Quine view, existence is not a property. They can have their property. And it can be a first order property, a property of individuals. It's just that it's not a real property in the sense that it's not a property that makes any difference. It's a property of being something. Uh, according to the property friendly Quinean, that's a trivial feature that anything has, being identical with something. Property friendly because, you know, Quine didn't love, didn't like properties. So he wouldn't have phrased the point by speaking of properties. Okay. Each party challenges the truth of the propositions expressed by Q and M, respectively, in the other party's mouth. The party that happens to be wrong is wrong about the property that predicate picks out, both in its own mouth and in anyone else's. It's being wrong as it's having false theoretical beliefs about that property. 
I think that's the right setup. Well, let's move on to objection two. Remember, that one is different from the first one because this one grants that Q and M do express contradictory propositions in the mouths of the two theorizing parties. But it also claims that the Manongian's view is an obviously flawed view. That's not just wrong, obviously wrong. And now I'm quoting again Manning Wagon, but now I don't agree with him anymore. Meinung's theory has a rather important defect, and that is that it is self-contradictory. Obviously self-contradictory. To unpack that a bit, let's go back to that notion of Frege analyticity. A sentence is Frege analytic when it can be obtained from a logical truth by a replacement of synonyms. Again, that goes back to Bogosian. So a bachelor is an unmarried man. Uh, that's Frege analytic because you get it from a bachelor is a bachelor by replacing synonyms. And so a sentence which can be obtained from a logical falsity by a replacement of synonyms expresses a Frege analytic falsity. Now M, this second objection goes, is one such sentence. X exists just as synonymous with their research a thing as X. So it is not the case that X exists is synonymous with is not. It is not the case that there is such a thing as X. So by one replacement of synonyms, M turns into a logical inconsistency. That's why it is obviously wrong. And more, Meinung himself specified the inconsistency at issue in that book that I mentioned before. He said, those who like paradoxical modes of expression could very well say, there are objects of which it is true that there are no such objects. You have, from, you have it from his own mouth. But now if you look at the dialectic at this point, you need to say the following. You cannot just assert that X exists as a synonym of there is such a thing as X and get away with it. You must provide evidence on pain of begging the question against the Meinungian. Now, Quinians often point at linguistic evidence. Or they use an argument which I'm going to label as the argument from italics, which I think uh, is based on an attempt to point at some kind of linguistic evidence. Why is that the argument of italics? Uh, because, uh, well, here's how it goes. That's funny, Wagner again. My non-organism entails that there are things that have no being of any sort, but if there are such things, italic, they obviously have being. For a thing to have being, italic, is for there to be such a thing as it. What else could being be? Rhetorical question. So to claim that their flag the italics is something that doesn't exist is to stumble upon the meaning of their is. No relevant difference can be detected between their is and exist. What could their is stand for as used in the vernacular if not what exists stand for? Again, notice a parallel with a debate, uh, this is a parenthetical remark, notice a parallel with debates uh, in the philosophy of logic. Um, People criticizing uh, supervaluationism by using variants of arguments from italics. You know, supervaluationism has a non truth functional account for, of this junction. So it can happen that either A or B is true when neither A nor B are true. In particular, either A or not A is always true, even in, situation where, in a situation where neither A nor not A are true. Right? And people object to. Uh, Supervaluationism by saying that, well, you, you're messing things up with this junction. You claim that either A or B holds, so either A or B, stamp the foot, bang the table, must hold. Okay. Use the italics. Okay. Um, now, I think that my Nongians have been sensitive to this kind of remark. And I think that that remark has prompted a certain schism between my non -gyans. 
So two claims are made in the argument uh, from italics. Claim A, to quantify is to ascribe being to what one quantifies over. B, being is the same as existence. A and B together entail that to quantify is to ascribe existence to what one quantifies over. Now claim B, that being is the same as existence, is another key claim of Quinean meta-ontology in the essay that bears that title, the essay that reintroduced the word meta-ontology. Uh, Van Wagen gives f five famous theses okay, that supposedly capture the core of my non-gam meta-ontology. Okay. Being is not an activity, uh, being is univocal, uh, the single notion of being is captured by the quantifier, um, being is the same as existence. And there's thesis five, which cannot easily be recaptured in a slogan. Let's not get into that. Uh, but it is claim A that is supported by the argument from italics. Okay? Now, some Minongians have felt the pressure of the argument. They have accepted A, granting that there is brings commitment to the being of the things one quantifies over. To block the conclusion that M is Frege analytically false, they have denied B. Things have being in some watered down form or other, despite occasionally lacking existence. And actually, people who don't know a lot about Minongianism think that Minongians are just those people, those who make a distinction between being and existence. Some do, but that's not true of them in general. That kind of Minongianism is more accurately described by um, Matti Eklund in his introduction to a meta-ontology in the philosophic compass as modes of being Minongianism. Modes of being Minongianism is a retreat. By attaching to quantification some watered-down ontological commitment, commitment to the watered-down being of what one quantifies over, that looks like a watered down form of Quinianism. Okay. So these people say, oh, anything has being, but not anything has that full-fledged form of being which should be called existence. Not everything exists, <coughs> but everything has being. I think that's a bad form of Minongianism. I prefer the other form of Minongianism that Matti Eklund calls no commitment Minongianism. The Minongian had better attack A, accept that being is the same as existence, and claim that some things just lack being, that is to say existence. You may be a monist and claim that being, that is to say existence, just means one thing, or you may say that there are many ways of having being or existence, but if there are different ways or modes of being, that is to say existing, uh, some things have none of them. That's the Graham Priest variant of Minonganism, for instance, and also the Richard Rutley variant of Minonganism. How? Well, by countering alleged linguistic evidence with linguistic evidence. Okay. And now I'm going to drop a, another meta-ontological remark, which is more of the methodological kind. Okay. Considerations from ordinary language semantics and meaning analysis are not as popular as they used to be. Okay. So 21st century ontologists don't like uh, to do ontology using the methodology of uh, linguistic analysis and meaning clarification. And giving you a quote from a mainstream uh, uh, ontologist and metaphysician, who is a, let's say, David Lewis school, okay? David Lewis metaphysics, Ted Sider. Sider says, today's ontologists are not conceptual analysts, Few attend to ordinary uses, usage of sentences like chairs exist. They treat competing positions as tentative hypotheses about the world and assess them with a loose battery of criteria for theory choice. Match with ordinary language and beliefs sometimes play a role, plays a role in this assessment, but typically not a dominant one. But in the dialectical situation in which we are now, resulting to linguistic considerations, I think, is a legitimate move, for it is the argument from italics that resorts to language to prove M. Frege analytically wrong. So it's, it's the Quinian now 
who is uh, pointing at what he or she thinks to be some kind of linguistic evidence. What can the aim of stressing a piece of language by italicizing it be here, if not to call one's atten attention on its being there? So it's as if Wagon, advancing the argument from italic, says, look, there's an occurrence of the verb to be. Stamp the foot, bang the table in M. Can't you see it? You are the one who is saying, there are things, blah, blah, blah. Arg, arg. Hmm? So granted that being is the same as existence, M expresses a Frege analytic falsity and is obviously self-contradictory, or only one substitution step away from logical falsity, because, well, there is a bloody is in there is. The reply to which is, I think, that the verb to be shows up in some of the quantification expressions that we use, lends thin linguistic support to the thick meta-ontological claim that we are always committed to the being or existence of whatever we quantify over. The verb to be is accidental to quantification. Quantificational devices have very different forms in natural languages. In lots of them, the verb to be or its counterparts in other languages, they don't show up at all. English uses some for some, largely, not always, for the same purposes as there is. I'll get back to this. Same for alcuni or qualche in my native tongue, the tongue of the country where I come from, which is also spoken in small bits of other countries. Um, Germans often use as gibt, We'd hardly conclude that they ascribe giving, being given to anything they quantify over. In a sense, being given may even be closer than exists to expressing what one often does by quantifying, as we're going to see in a minute. In French, you typically say il y a. Être doesn't show up. We wouldn't claim that the Frenchmen are ascribing having to things just because they quantify on them by using the expression il y a. And more seriously, um, as pointed out by Frederick and Moltmann, so Moltmann is a, is a metaphysician and linguist. Um, she's been my boss for a couple of years when I was in Paris. I survived. And at the end, uh, <laughs> and at the end in 2009, while I was finished, she, she was infected by, by my talking about uh, mind on an existence all the time. And she came up with this paper called The Semantics of Existence, in which she gives a lot of linguistic evidence for there being uh, lots of there is for some construction, which are not reducible to what the Quinean wants them to be reducible to. So there is for some Ilia, Esgibt, Che, Sida, and so on. They often use as locative constructions. The task, says Moltmann, is to present the relevant objects, to introduce them in discourse, or to situate them in a wider context. So they often come with locational restrictions. You say things like, there are two trucks here, there are two more down there, there's a girl waiting in the car, there was a guy at the door this morning looking for you. These are just unfeasible with exists. One wouldn't claim of the four trucks that you exist here while you exist down there, or that a girl exists in the car waiting, or that a guy existed at the door this morning and while he existed there he was looking for you. That's bad for a supposedly always replaceable synonym. You, you, such restrictions are acceptable with, with mass nouns or bare plural. So you can say things like, uh, um, with such massive exploitation, oil soon will exist no more in the Northern Sea. Okay. In that case, that's fine. Not in these cases. The Minongian even not rule out that there is in many, if not most cases, does encode or entail existence. For Minongians, existentially committing quantification is just restricted quantification. Okay because they have their own existence predicate. It's not a predicate that is defined through the quantifier like, they might, like the Quinians do. So you can use it to restrict what you quantify as range over. 
The restriction can be specified via the appropriate non-blanket existence predicate, but it can usually be left implicit as conversationally understood. And we often restrict our quantifiers. Actually, we nearly always restrict our quantifiers. Maybe we drop any restriction we can drop in the ontology room, but otherwise, our quantifiers are typically presentist, uh, restricted to things in our surroundings, objects which are relevant, even the, what we're talking about, and so on. Uh, let's drop this. And let's move to the conclusion, which is a very, very rough uh, uh, meta-ontological point that I'd like to make. Attempting to refute Meinongians by appealing to a presumed Frege analyticity of the Quinean claim, or to the fact that the mere understanding of the proposition expressed by it is sufficient to mandate assent, is, I think, not a promising move. Lots of ontological views can be easily accused of equivocation or analytical falsehood. Think about modern metaphysics and David Lewis. In modern metaphysics, you could reject David Lewis's model realism. It takes two minutes. You say, oh, it's analytic that everything is actual. And so Lewis's ontology of non-actual possibilia is analytically false. That has actually been claimed. So in the early days of modern realism, some have tried this fast rejection. Susan Hark, for instance, will liken again. But such fast rejection has not taken place Modern realism is now a respectable theory on the philosophical market. Many believe it to be false. Actually, I'd say the vast majority of people believe that modern realism is just false. Um, even necessarily false, given the model status of its key claims. But to show this, you need way more than a quick argument to the effect that such key claims are analytic falsehoods or denials of things that command assent to competent speakers of English. To generalize a bit, the most promising attempts to refute a philosophical view may start by assigning to their target as much theoretical strength as charitable interpretation allow. Okay. So this is my appeal to charity with which I'm going to conclude the talk. Thanks. <laughs>